Hitting revenue targets is hard and requires constant hustle. Last quarter's success is already forgotten. Learn the mindset and tactics of today's most successful revenue producers in B2B marketing and sales. We call this the revenue hustle. I'm your host, Tom Hessen, navigating you on this journey. Today's show is sponsored by Nine Lenses, an interactive assessment platform that enables you to add instant value to your buyers and allows your sales team to tailor business conversations focused on the pain points each and every time. Check them out at NineLenses.com. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce David Ryan, our next guest on the Revenue Hustle. As you know, my name is Tom Hessen. I'm the host and the CEO of Nine Lenses. Really excited for this conversation. Dave and I have got to know each other over the past several months. We are uh, kindred spirits in the sales ecosystem. David, welcome to the Revenue Hustle. Thank you, Tom. A pleasure to be here. And so, David, you're the CEO of Gray Matter. Um, You've got a really interesting background. I'm not going to try to unpack it all myself, but why don't you just give a quick overview of you and Gray Matter? Very happy to do that. Well, uh, it all started back in the uh, the mid 80s or so with IBM. Uh, I uh, carried a bag, uh, large account responsibilities, Quaker Oats, Sara Lee, Time Incorporated. I think I learned from one of the best uh, back then in terms of what it means to service clients, go wide and deep at those uh, uh, firms, uh, at those organizations in terms of hardware, software, services, etc. Then I found my way into the IT consulting space, uh, a small a startup here in Chicago that grew from about four to 74 million in the time I was wow. there. I ran pretty much all of our revenue generating sides of the business as well as co-ran our CRM practice. So I got my first taste of uh, delivery, utilization, client deliverables, all those sorts of things. And that's where I kind of saw the contrast between the world of IBM and that of professional services. And uh, decided to start a business in 02 that uh, really helped uh, pro services firms kind of up their game in terms of growth. How do they scale revenue? How do they scale top line? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those uh, ideas and, and I think deeper into our conversation. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, so Dave and I have had several conversations uh, just in, in, uh, in, in sales and professional services and, and consulting and, and helping people sell. So I just wanted to have him on the show and just kind of share our conversations with the broader community because I think David's got a lot of wisdom and doing some really interesting stuff. I haven't heard anyone that does exactly what you do. So I thought it'd be great. So, all right, David, you know, we do these revenue rules. Yeah. Um, what is your first revenue rule? Well, I think number one is uh, for pro services firms, whether you're audit tax, IT consultant, financial risk consultant, supply chain consultant, healthcare consultant, ops consultant, strategy consultant, engineer architects, right? Um, I, I really, you know, you've got so many people who are client facing, delivering every day, either on site pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID, but also through this interaction, uh, there's a lot of face time with clients by delivery professionals. Uh, yet I don't think that constituency is leveraged well enough to be in the game to be a lead generator, to help identify incremental opportunities, uh, to uh, cross-sell uh, other competencies of their firm. Uh, these are individuals who are very smart, but they tend to be heads down, blinders on, working on the task at hand, and oftentimes missing uh, on some signals. Uh, data points, nuggets of information around other needs that the client might have. And so how do you activate the biggest asset of a professional services firm, uh, your delivery professionals, yeah. to be more participative in biz dev, not necessarily selling and closing, but more lead generation? Yeah. No, I mean, I am a former consultant as well. And so I certainly understand what it's like to be on the ground. The client's telling you to do this. You've got milestones. You've got deadlines. You know, you've got, you know, somebody keeping track of the P&L. But, you know, nowhere did I ever get any training on, okay, what should you be thinking about in terms of sales? That was somebody else's job. But there's a tremendous amount of trust, right? I think that's what you're saying. Like, there's so much trust built with the client delivery people that it's, you know, they'd rather talk to you than the salesperson, so to speak, right? Right. Hopefully there's that trust. Uh, I, I We'll talk about that a little bit later, about tactical trust versus strategic trust. But there's no question that consultants uh, are getting access to more information than maybe the sales folks are or those partners who kind of fly in and out of the, right. out the client situation. And so if we can just get these folks to pay attention, 
listen a little bit better, connect the dots between those nuggets of information that are being received, they're receiving, uh, and your firm's competencies, and then share that with those that might uh, do something about it, the professional sellers, if you will. Now you've got deal flow at the front end of the pipeline that you never would have seen before. Yeah, and so how do you go about enabling that group? Because I think what makes them great delivery people um, are, you know, certain traits and characteristics that may not always translate into sales. And, you know, that sales is a four little word to some of these people, you know, would give them a cold sweat at night if they had thought about having to open up a PowerPoint and do a pitch presentation, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, this is a huge opportunity. I completely see it, but I imagine there's resistance that you've had to, un, you know, overcome as you've brought these people along their, you know, this journey. No question, Tom. Listen, this is not new news, this whole idea of how do we better leverage our delivery professionals. Uh, every firm at one point or another has tried to do this or at least thought about it. But I, I just don't think they've figured it out. Too often they'll do maybe a lunch and learn, right? And hey, listen for this, or here's some of our other capabilities, watch out for these things. But the reality is, uh, you know, you might get a little bit of spike in activity for that first week, but people kind of default back into their right. comfort. And that's delivery. And so how do you crack the code and 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 not only activate this group, but make it sustainable? Um, it's not easy. And I'll be honest with you, in 19 years uh, we've been doing this, uh, you know, we've been continuing to sort of hone our approach. But I think it's anchored in a couple of things. Number one, um, you got to be careful about positioning it as selling, because as you said, it's sort of a bad word. And, you know, these are individuals who've worked so hard, these consultants, to build their street cred with their client through their technical competence. Right, right. The last thing they want is for the client to think that they're getting sold or hustled by this consultant. The quickest way to undermine any credibility that's been built to this point is to, you know, is for at least the consultant to think that they're selling, right? So they just don't go there. So I think it's really couching it more, and we call it relationship expansion for professionals. If you're doing a better job of deepening line of sight relationships with those that you're already working with, but also uh, really thinking through how do we widen our footprint of contacts and relationships, right? right. Be attentive to that. Um, but also, you know, in terms of the, the upskilling, I think it's about keeping it simple. Uh, the last thing you want to do is overwhelm an already overwhelmed group of individuals with a bunch of sales shtick, right? And so keep it simple. Um, give them a process. I think that's the other thing. So simple concepts that they're probably already doing, but maybe not doing as consistently or at the level that's moving the needle, okay? But also give them a process. Uh, these are very systematic individuals. They tend to be. They're methodical. You know, consultants uh, have right. a uh, a, a, a science around how they approach their projects. Well, wrapper a science around building and nurturing relationships and uncovering lead gen. Uh, if you give them that that uh, that process, it's almost like that safety net and that high high wire act we're asking them to go to go do right. Give me a safety net and I might go up there. Don't give me a safety net, no process, and I might not do it. It's not, yeah, it's too risky. Yeah, okay. and I I've I've learned too that. You know, consultants, like you said, have the technical <clears throat> expertise. So whether you're an accountant or a or an IT person, you know, you have a domain expertise, which is why you're on that particular project, right? Solving a particular need. Um, but the firm that you're representing may sell things, you know, all over the board that you don't even understand, or you don't even, you know, you, you may know that we have a cybersecurity group, and I hear the client talking about cybersecurity. And you're like, there's no way I'm going to get involved in that conversation because I, right. I don't even I don't even know who works in that department. Right. So, like, how do you kind of work that sort of unfamiliarity of the different offerings into that program? Yeah. I, again, great question. I, I Part of this is breaking down some of the, the fear factor. OK. Uh, and some of the uh, speed bumps that people put up for themselves. Right. And I think one of them is. As a consultant, we always want to be right. We always want to have the answer. We don't want to look dull in front of the client. And so if I start to find my way as a consultant into a conversation that's outside my area of expertise, I'm probably going to begin to shut it down, right? I, I'm not going to go there uh, because right. uh, I'm not going to look real good. And so part of the part of the breaking down some of the, the fear factor is, hey, you don't have to have all the answers, 
you don't have to be an expert in everything. You should be level five in your area of expertise. Right, right. But just have a working knowledge about the other capabilities of your firm at a very high level. And it's okay to say to the client, you know, Mr. Client, I'm a state and local tax uh, consultant, as you know, and that's my area of expertise. And it sounds like you have kind of a data analytics issue or challenge. I know we have that competency, certainly not my area of expertise, but I'd be happy to get you in touch with those individuals who are responsible for that side of our business. That's all you need to do, right? But again, we stop ourselves as consultants because we want to be perfect and we want to have yeah. all the answers. And so uh, it's really just breaking down some of uh, the things that get in their way. Get out. Let's get you out of your own way. Yeah. Now, have you ever seen a situation where like the, the, the project team doesn't want to invite other people in because it's my account. I have the relationships. I'm trying to sell my own thing. I do not want to bring in the other practice. So I purposely don't bring them in because I don't want them to upset my, my gravy train here. Come on, Tom, that never happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, honestly, let's, let's be, uh, let's think about this. No question. Uh, you're embedded, doing great work. Uh, there's, uh, you know, a, a whole series of projects lined up in this particular area of expertise. Uh, that revenue gravy train is looking good. And uh, do I want to risk it by bringing in another practice area that I have some doubts about, or maybe I have some questions, or I really don't know their level of skill. And right. gosh, right. if they don't deliver that puts my work at risk. So yes, there, uh, that happens a lot. I will also tell you that, you know, uh, from a sales standpoint, the sellers sometimes kind of box out the services side of the business. Yeah. I see this more with some of the big, uh, you know, uh, hardware software providers. They also have a services dimension and those sellers uh, are anchored in kind of thin margin hardware and software sales uh, and, but but it's, you know, I'm making my revenue number and things are looking pretty good. And if I bring us the service side of the house in and they don't deliver on a project, you know, again, it puts at risk uh, the, uh, the, 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 you know, what I've been uh, creating in terms of the hardware software, although thin margin. So, again, there has to be some level of trust and confidence. Uh, the reality is the only way you scale revenue is by better leveraging the entire team. Uh, and so, yes, there are always some, there's some internal channel conflicts, if you will, and that's going to happen. But again, it's, it's more of a matter of finding ways to work with each other and uh, build that level of trust internally. Yeah. So I'd love to hear just some, how this has kind of unfolded with some clients, just, you know, whether it's recent or not, but just like, you know, for, I've got a large um Following, uh, following is not the right word, but just a lot of uh, people in my network that are professional services that are in, in the roles. Um, and I, I'm curious what they would ask you or what they should expect to just, you know, again, this is a hard thing that takes time and effort and staying power. Uh, yeah. Like, what are some of the things that you've seen successfully uh, implemented? Well, again, there's the learning moment. Um, so there's some discovery on the front end. We customize all of our learnings to make sure that they're aligned around the constituency that we're targeting. Uh, what are we asking these people to do differently in terms of their behaviors? Uh, and so we'll we'll customize. And we've got about two dozen modules of content that we've uh, uh, developed over the last 18, 19 years. And so we'll tune those up and take you know a few of these, a few of these, and package them together to customize a program uh, that uh, meets the needs of the particular constituency, what level they are, experience level, what are we asking them to do? Uh, we'll usually deliver it in a, in a live program or live Zoom. And we found that even in COVID, uh, you know, we're gonna have to break down an eight or nine hour uh, a, a set of content that's usually delivered live in two half days back to back. We're gonna have to break that down from a Zoom standpoint um, or remote learning standpoint into maybe four two hour and 15 minute sessions, just because you can't sit in front of a, a screen sure. for four yeah. and a half hours. Yeah. But once the learning moment is over, 
you know, yeah, there has to be something downstream of that experience to help support and nurture the learnings. You can't just cross your fingers and hope good things happen. And so we've created a post-learning experience through a software platform, a uh, proprietary software platform that continues for about 90 days to uh, support the students in a couple of ways. One, every week they get pinged through email or text uh, with a quick refresher. Uh, of one of the concepts. We want to stay top of mind with them because quite honestly, I know what happens. They go right back into delivery mode when I'm done with them, right? And, that, and that's okay. Yeah. But hopefully we've turned the light bulb on for them and they've seen that they are capable of doing this, but we do need to just stay top of mind. So if we can find a subtle way to do that, great. And so we do it in the form of these 90 second, I call them audio booster shots, audio or video booster shots. Um, in addition, there's some goals that the students are co uh, commit to at the begin, at, right after the learning moment. What do you want to work on over the next 90 days? And we'll check in with them usually once uh, uh, or twice over the 90 days, maybe once a month, so maybe three times over the 90 days. And again, it creates a little bit of that accountability. And they're just doing a quick readout. It takes three or four minutes just to share what uh, relative to the goals that I committed to, uh, what have you done and what are you going to do next? And there's a dashboard that gives visibility to our exec sponsors so that they see who's staying on task and maybe who's not, and they can nudge them along. Uh, we also assess the, the uh, skills of the, the participants at the beginning of the program and at the end of the 90 days. So we can see, are we moving the needle? in terms of their qualitative ability to execute on certain skills, but we also ask questions, quantitative questions, like in the last 90 days, the number of new relationships you've created at current clients, or new relationships you've created internally with other practice areas, mm. or relationships you've refreshed with past clients, contacts, colleagues uh, that may have gone a little bit stale, re-engaging them. We also ask in the last 90 days, the number of new opportunities you've created uh, at current clients. And so we'll get a before versus after. And right. uh, the beauty of that is, you know, all we want to do is if a leading indicator is more relationships, right? More relationships and more touches. And if we're doing that, we are bound to stumble across deal flow. Right. And then we see it bear out in the number of opportunities that are created by these individuals. Now, we have to reconcile that with the internal CRM system and such. But the reality yeah. is the the deal flow, you know, if we can get out of 25 students in one class, uh, you know, five, maybe 10 new opportunities within, you know, 90 days to six months of our program. And we close on half of those. Right. And our, our average deal size is 100K. I don't know, that's $500,000 of incremental revenue, and I just, you know, charged you a, a, a fraction of that. Uh, sure, so yeah, yeah. The ROI yeah. is so clear, uh, yeah. and uh, so uh, I hope that helps. No, uh, no, that's no, that's really helpful. I think that really paints a really strong picture of what that looks like um, and how, the, how this translates into opportunities. I love your point about more engagements or more relationships with more touch points equals pipeline right and that's uh it's a, it's a nice way to think about it there's the relationship side because that's what a lot of these people you know typically do well no question about it no question about it so uh yeah so that's uh, our, our, our story on that side okay no that was really um really interesting what's your uh, second revenue rule <laughs> well i think it kind of uh, piggybacks on the first one but you know the reality is in professional services um we become hugely commoditized, right? And so how do we better leverage everyone who touches the client and shapes the client experience to up our game in terms of creating differentiation on behalf of our firm? And so uh, it's not only just the, uh, the delivery folks, but it's obviously our sellers as well and our senior, senior delivery people as well. How do we up their game? I, I, um, uh, so it's not revenue uh, rule one, activate your consultants. Number two is everybody who touches the client and shapes the client experience needs to know that every one of those touches is either uh, tipping the scales for or against us in a commoditized world called professional services. So we've got to do a better job uh, around that client experience. Uh, the back end service delivery has become commoditized. You know, the mantra back in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, do good work and I'll get more work. I don't think that's legit anymore. 
um, do good work and you'll get a look, right? You might get a shot at that next piece of business, but that's table stakes. You better do good work. Right. And so now in this world of commoditized professional service, how do you create separation? And to me, it shifted from the back end service delivery to the front end client experience. So it's really about how do we better leverage everybody who touches the client? Those experience, those touches have to be high quality uh, and they have to be game changers in terms of differentiation. So th that would be that yeah. other. Yeah, uh, so I mean, obviously, yeah, so that's, that's great. So when the front office, or the you know everyone interacting with a client I mean leaves an impression right every person you bring on the project every person you bring in front of the client um, obviously delivery's got to go well or you're just out the door right I mean that's just um, so how do you translate that into coordinating all these different things looking at it from a client experience because there's so many different touch points it's hard to kind of get that view well I, again I think every, you know anybody who how would I say it uh, yeah, there's a lot of touch points. So I think everybody uh, in the firm needs to know that, again, I said it, we've got to raise our game. What does raising our game look like? Um, I'll give you an example. You know, oftentimes um, when we're doing our discovery with our clients, uh, I'll ask the question, do you consider you and your firm a trusted advisor? Oh, absolutely. There's not been a single one of my prospects who said we are not a trusted advisor. Right? Yeah, right. And then I'll let follow on. I said, well, what does that look like? What does that experience look like? Well, you know, we um, uh, we respond quickly to any questions that our client our clients have. Uh, if they have an issue, a challenge, a particular need, we will run through walls to find the right people at the right time to get in in front of those folks. Uh, uh, and so they'll go on and on and describe what that alleged trusted advisor relationship looks like. And we'll finish and I'll say, I'll, I'll tell you what, Mr. Prospect, uh, I'll grant you trusted advisor status. But it feels very tactical. It feels very reactive. We're waiting right. for things to come to us. On the flip side of that, there's this thing called strategic trusted advisor status. And in my opinion, that's the rarefied era that we're trying to get to as consultants, as providers of services. And it's really hard to get there. Now, what does that look like? Well, we are an equal partner in this conversation with our clients. Uh, our conversations are open and honest. I'm probably sharing information with the client or calling out th some things that they may not want to hear, but they swallow hard because they know we come from a place right. of advocacy. We're their wingman, wing person. We're their advocate. Uh, we know your business beyond the project. We know the other issues and challenges that you have. We're constantly right. bringing a point of view, insights to you. We're filling in your knowledge gaps, your blind spots. So to me, that is a whole different game than the wait for it to come to us and react. And to get there, I, I believe it's that client experience. Um, and what does that mean? Hey, we better have done our homework on our client beyond the project. We better know their business. And too often we deploy consultants or sales folks who know, know about that much about the client's business. Really? How do you become a strategic trusted advisor when you don't know only sliver of their of, of, right. of their story? Or chart, financial, short and long-term objectives, competitive issues, industry issues, mission, vision. I don't know about you, but when I'm deployed with that broader base of knowledge, I have more to say. I have I, I listen better, I ask better questions, I'm more thoughtful about my opinion. I can connect the dots between this project and other initiatives that you're trying to to uh to uh, uh, accomplish, and oh, by the way, I'm separating myself from all the other providers who come in not prepared and are very tactical. Right, so, and I suspect that that takes time to acquire that, right? You can't, it, 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 you have to earn that right, I guess, right? Like you have to want it and earn it at the same time. Uh, it's just not bestowed on you. You have to kind of earn the, you know, absolutely. to get into those conversations, right? You gotta climb the credibility curve. Um, I love uh, re referring to David Meister's uh, trust equation, you know, credibility plus reliability plus professional intimacy divided by self-orientation equals trust. And we as consultants uh, early on are leaning on credibility and reliability to build that credit, build that goodwill, if you will. But eventually, you know, professional intimacy comes into play. And oh, by the way, minimizing self-orientation 
where we're in it for the client, not for ourselves. And too often, let's be honest, I, and I've been party to it, droning on and on about all of our capabilities and competencies and right, I'm making it about me, not my client, right? right? So to me, little things matter. Doing your homework, um, uh, you know, uh, personal awareness, uh, being able to communicate in a net and succinct way who and what your firm is about, meeting management, meeting preparation, uh, we are being vetted at every turn. If you can't manage a 30-minute discovery meeting with me in an effective way, how are you going to manage this half-million-dollar project I've got in my back pocket? Right, right, right. So we are being assessed at every turn, and so we've got to bring our A-game all the time. Now, coordinating the entire team to be on that same page means account planning, account management, account um, uh, uh, knowledge and research and making sure the entire team is up to speed on that. There's a cadence of interactions. There's delegation of responsibilities of who's on for which relationships. So it's got to be orchestrated. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, I was going to say, who owns that? And you started to go into that because you're right. There's all this activity, planning and execution that needs to happen. Uh, but someone's got to know what the playbook is on, on how to do that and, and be responsible for that. It, it's uh, um, it's not al always pretty uh, at pro services firms uh, when it comes to account management, account planning, um, account uh, uh, penetration execution. You know, usually the BD folks or that individual who's responsible for the growth of that particular account should be leading that charge. Um, but it's not... Um, I have found pro services firms struggle with it um, because it's hard, you know, all these people are billable. Most of these people are billable. So it's hard to justify uh, getting a lot of billable people into a room to do account planning and account management and or account governance on a monthly or quarterly basis because I'm losing billable time, right? And so until those firms really see the um, uh, the ROI, the return on investment of doing this, so they have to invest the time, they have to put the rigor and discipline in place, and then it doesn't happen overnight. It's going to take a, a few months to see traction, but once they see the traction, they buy in. The problem is, in pro services, we're so short-term focused, right. and so we're not seeing this stuff through long enough to see the benefit. And so, you know, they walk away from, they're, they're all well-intended, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it's the next shiny thing kind of a thing. Yeah, I mean, I know, I mean, account planning is, especially in these bigger accounts, right, where you're, you know, you're in one part of the business and you're trying to just grow that as well as break into these others. You have to be really mindful about what's going on over there. Who do we know over there internally or externally? You know, what are we going to pitch to that person? How do we get an audience with those folks? Um, you know, what's the account goal this year right just in terms of revenue i mean it's just it's a very sales heavy conversation right like just an orchestration well and it's crm heavy right uh, you, you got to have a system that manages this and you have to be have people using it using all that wonderful functionality that sadly isn't being used so that we can coordinate our efforts so we do have optics into the goings on across the account uh, the last thing we want to do is being step is step on each other's toes, or uh, speaking to someone today and and the client goes, well, didn't I talk to one of your people last week, right? And that doesn't look so good. So, to me, that that CRM system, uh, whatever it is, uh, is critical. That's the system of record. Unfortunately, again, either a lot of the individuals who are touching the client and having those conversations don't have access to the C CRM system, A or B. Even if they have access, they're not putting that information into the system. And so, again, we lack the visibility and the discipline. Yeah, I think that's probably a big difference between professional services and, let's say, software or SaaS companies where the salespeople are constantly putting stuff into CRM, whereas professional services, most people don't even have access to it, like you said. I mean, I've, you know, I don't know what level, you know, but most people, only the sales or, you know, the partners and so on have access to that typically. Well, if you can get seen, at least the, the top rung of delivery also having access, and then maybe you have a process for how do you get that next level down, who doesn't have access, but is having interactions that need to get reflected in the CRM. If there's a process for getting that, in, maybe you hand it off to someone in administration, uh, a sales, sales enablement, uh, to get that information in. As long as there's a process for getting that intel in, you don't 
necessarily have to give everybody seat licenses, right? Right, sure. Uh, but the, but the, so the process sort of trumps the, the seat license, if you will, if it, it's used, if the process makes sense, uh, and if people are are executing against the process. So. Uh, now, there's a lot of moving parts in this. I'll, I'll be quite honest with you. Tom. Yeah, I, I, it seems very organizationally complex. Just for for you know that means that that's a top down decision with a ton of buy in. If I were the CEO of a professional services firm, would you recommend I do your revenue rule one or my revenue rule two as a easier, quicker win? Wow, um, I, I <laughs> that's a great question. I, I think they're kind of part and parcel. I mean, if we're activating yeah. our consultants to do a better job of building and deepening relationships, they're probably changing the approach that they're taking in terms of uh, upping their game around the client experience. Okay. I think I, 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 I kind of think those two go together. Yeah. Um, but quite honestly, I mean, listen, if you take uh, Think about who's going to have the biggest impact from a consulting standpoint. Target that, call it senior managers. These are individuals who are leading projects. They've got junior individuals reporting up to them on their team. These are people are our tip of the spear. They're looked upon and trusted by the client for the most part. Uh, those that's probably where you start. You know that not partner level revenue generators. They're supposed to be doing this, but that next gen right, level right, of right. individuals. That's probably where you get the biggest bang for the buck. Let's activate that group. And in the process of activating them, the client experience is gonna be upped as well by that group of individuals. Then you leverage that group, uh, so it's a pilot, let's say it's a pilot, but then you, it's a proof of concept and good things happen and now you replicate that program. And now you're creating this critical mass of individuals who <laughs> have seen the light, right? They, they get it, they understand, they've seen the payoff in terms of uh, their ability to engage at a higher level and un uncover incremental deal flow. And then you leverage those people as sort of your mentors and coaches for the next group of individuals who go through the skill building. So now it becomes sort of this um, grassroots movement where everybody's supporting each other you're, uh, and, and you're pushing it down to more junior people. Trust me, the concepts that we're teaching are pretty simple and straightforward, but the process is really important. Yeah. So well, this can get pushed down to pretty junior people. And wouldn't it be nice if you're beginning to turn the light bulb on for the most junior consultants earlier in their career around the importance of client relationship building and uh, client experience. And so that they're doing it sooner, you're getting a, bigger payback uh, from that individual earlier in their career. And now they're carrying that forward deeper into their career. They, they're they wired that way. Let's right. not wait till there's senior managers to flip the switch. Let's get them in the game sooner. Right, right. right. So yeah, if I answered your question. No, but... no, no, I, I yeah. And I, I remember in my own, you know, consulting career was my first job at a, at a university was, uh, I started in delivery just like everybody else, but I have always had kind of this sales bent. I always aspired to be in those sales conversations well, well ahead of when I should have been, but I wanted to be there, right? I just, you know, they were like, no, you have nothing to add, right? So I, I got why I didn't get access to it, but there's a lot of firms that don't provide kind of that sales path, you know, until they're needing to do it to get promotion up to that partner managing director level. And at that point, you know, you could have been grooming them to be better sellers along the way to be thinking this way, but more often it's about milestones, you know, deadlines, quality of deliverables, but nowhere do they ever foster the sales um, skill set. You're absolutely right. I, I will tell you that a lot of uh, pro services are starting to realize uh, this, that they need to start activating their consultants earlier in their careers. So let's not wait till their senior managers flip the switch and hope they can drive revenue, right? Uh, and so I'm seeing that movement in the 19 years we've been doing it. I mean, you compare that, you know, early 2000s to where we are now and it's night and day. But it's there's still some firms that just still are, are thinking in terms of, hey, quality delivery, crank out the deliverables, bill my hours, hit my utilization targets, and, you know, I'm going to lean on my sales guys and my senior partners to drive all the rev. That is not scalable. It's just not scalable. And isn't that what we're all talking about these days? I will also tell you, Tom, that, uh, let's be honest, in pro services, it's white hot right now. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, November sure of 2021. Most of those firms are sold out. 
we're still getting work uh, <laughs> to because of a couple reasons. One, we're going to upskill our people ahead of the curve because we know that the pendulum is going to swing back at some point and we want our people activated so that we can keep the momentum going. Number one. Two, it's retention. It's a retention play. You're seeing so much turnover these days, right. rank and file consulting. Um, consulting firms are looking for ways to set the hook and keep their people and show that they're, they are valued resources. And part of it is making an investment in them beyond their technical skills rounding out their competencies this is one of them and uh no, that's yeah so. no that's great i know i know the turnover is really high right now just everyone's kind of running to greener pastures and um everyone's just scrambling to grab people from other places and and, and differentiating your firm and, and planting those seeds and providing those skills i can certainly see it as a as a reason to want to stay because that's probably not offered in other places right it's it's still at least in my limited visibility into these firms i think they're realizing they have to do it but again only a sliver of the firms are are doing it actually doing it you know i will add one more thing tom and i know we're kind of winding down yeah. but um you know i've talked about a lot about what the sort of the ecosystem uh the infrastructure needs to look like to enable this to be sustainable and so we talked about the skill building the post learning experience and the accountability and keeping it simple giving a process but I will tell you, uh, one of the, the, the things that has to happen is a program like this has to be supported from leadership, it has to be supported by P&L leadership, office managing partner, regional managing partner, uh, practice area leaders, the individuals who are on for growth of their practices. With all due respect to HR and learning and development and sales or marketing, um, if those are mark, if those are initiatives driven by those functions, uh, I, I don't see this as a sustainable program. The delivery side of the house has to buy into this, and the leadership has to buy into it, and they have to echo uh, right from the beginning that this is important, that we want you to <laughs> be thinking right. in these terms, right? And they have to support it and model it. And if it doesn't come from there, I will tell you, uh, we'll get a nice spike of, of, of uh, activity uh, from our program, but it won't be sustainable. Right, right. We'll have to buy the, the more junior people who are getting this have to see from the top that this is supported and important. Right. Well, I know growth is important everywhere right now. I mean, and and um, and so you would think that this would be something that people would latch on to. That's why I've always really valued your, your value prop, just because it's so unique. Um, you know, not a lot of people are talking about, you know, upskilling consultants for sales training and, and abilities. And I think that's an obvious opportunity that a lot of firms overlook. Um, and, and so, as I mentioned, you know, we, you and I have had numerous conversations because we're kind of coming at this problem in two different spots. You're coming from training and process and programs and expertise and curriculums. And I'm coming at it with software, um, giving these people tools to help mm -hmm. them sell like these value assessments we've talked about. So if a client has a cybersecurity problem and you're in the accounting practice, you know, you're like, great, well, we have a cyber risk assessment here and give that to the client, let the software deliver value rather than having it come out of my mouth and my head, which is terrifying for some. And so it's just have been a really interesting um, synergies talking to you about this, this, this problem. Yeah, well, Tom, I, I love what you guys are offering. Again, it's another uh, uh, tool, if you will, that augments how we're getting our message uh, into the market. Uh, and as you said, uh, listen, the consultants, even if we activate them 100%, um, you know, there's still going to be some anxiety around how do I deliver that message. And if we can find some other ways, in addition to what I just talked about, to comfortably deliver insights, uh, cross-selling opportunities through, say, uh, an assessment, uh, a survey and assessment, and a benchmarking exercise that you guys bring to the table that will initiate some conversation around other lines of business that we have competencies in, great. Let's stir the pot, man. Uh, right. So, you know, again, I think these these work in tandem. Well, I certainly hope we have many more conversations like this, David. It's always a pleasure to just pick your brain and kind of hear your your years of experience as a seller and now uh, helping others to sell. Where can we follow you online? Well, uh, my email address is uh, D R Y A N at Gray G R A Y Matters M A T T E R S Group dot com, and of course our website is www 
gray, G-R-A-Y, matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, group.com. And uh, that's that's the best place to find us. Okay. Well, fantastic. Well, thanks again for coming on to the Revenue Hustle. It's been my pleasure. And uh, we'll hope to bring you on sometime down the line. Awesome. Tom, thank you very much. All the best. Thank you for tuning in to the Revenue Hustle. This episode has been brought to you by Nine Lenses. Close more deals with interactive assessments. Check them out at ninelenses.com. See you next time.